This episode is sponsored by Moschio Prosecco. Want to sell sparklers in 187s? Moschio has them in Brut, Extra Dry, and Rosé. Look for the 12-bottle party pack. National restaurant chains are going through big changes as the new generation of diners prefer new concepts like fast casual. How is this trend affecting wine sales? Let's find out. This is Wine Biz 360, in-depth coverage of the wine industry. For wine professionals, by wine professionals, here is your host, Joe Janish. And today we have Thomas Harrell, National Accounts On-Premise Manager, East Region for Banfi Vintners. Thomas, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Thomas, your specialty now is on-premise national accounts, but your career in the wine business began on the golf course. Can you share that story with us? Yes, I'd love to. So, it was kind of unique. Um, I was currently working at Plantation Country Club in Ponte Vedras, getting my internship for agronomy. I had all my sciences and saw the opportunity to do uh, actually transfer to the clubhouse. So I transferred from the clubhouse, or excuse me, agronomy to the grounds to the clubhouse and worked there, leaving their assistant club manager for seven years and then got promoted to Sawgrass Country Club, being club manager and sommelier for both the golf club and beach club. So at that point, after four years, they were tearing down my club and I got offered a position with Premier Beverage and worked for them for 10 years and shortly left after that to work for Bronco Wine Company and then left to go for Excelsior Fine Wines, selling our South American portfolio for two years, doing uh, national account military and national account on-premise and then uh, got offered the position with Banffy. So I have been with Banffy since uh, March of 2014. It's the company I've always wanted to work for, and I'm home finally. So don't plan on leaving anytime soon, but uh, have really decided, enjoyed being here, and I'm glad to be a part of the family at Banffy Vintners. Yeah, thanks. I always have people saying, how did you get into the wine industry? And you know, I don't think anyone at least very few people grow up thinking, oh, someday I'm going to be working in the wine industry. Like we generally don't go to school for something like that. So I'm always interested in hearing the background of how people get into the industry. And it it seems like once we get in, we stay, we don't go anywhere else. Yeah, this is definitely a a small batch of us uh, in in the United States. We enjoy people, enjoy the restaurants and people think that we're drinking wine every day. (laughs) <laughs> starting at 8 a.m. and drinking until 5 p.m. But uh, there's a lot of work that goes involved with making brands successful, uh, especially with there, there being a glut of so many wines out there and so many great wines at that. And we're lucky to have the ones we do. Absolutely. And we generally don't start at 8 a.m. Usually we start around 9.15. I, I was going to say 10 a.m., but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it depends which coast you're on. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> well, it depends. Is it wine-based cocktails? Or are we drinking Prosecco in the morning? Because I think every day is a celebratory day. We should celebrate life. So why not have Prosecco in the morning with our coffee? Wait, Prosecco counts? I I usually have my Prosecco at 7.15 and then like the wine doesn't start till you know, closer to 10. <laughs> There you go. I, I I gotta visit you more in New York, you know, if you're gonna be drinking like this all the time. <laughs> Love to have you anytime. So Thomas, your specialty has been on premise national accounts for a few years now. Let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in that world of national restaurant accounts. We recently heard that Macaroni Grill is filing chapter eleven. They're the latest in a growing line of restaurant chains that are trouble. I mean, Ruby Tuesday was sold earlier this year. They're struggling. Garden Fresh filed Chapter 11. Joe's Crab Shack filed for bankruptcy and then closed 40 units in August. Standard & Poor's is saying that restaurants top the list of their most distressed companies. What is going on and how is this affecting what you do in selling wine to this part of the business? First, let's touch upon what you said about the restaurant. I mean, we have seen where, and I hate to bring up millennials or Generation Z or Generation X, but uh, we're so focused in on what their mindset is and that we're always evolving and changing our uh, the wine programs to adapt to them, which we were always tried and true, where if you've seen through the different restaurants that have come up where it was 
that pub style, that more American bistro style hamburgers and, and ribs where those were a focus. But now the menus has expanded so large that it's it's not really focused on where it was. I remember when I was a kid waiting in line two two hours to get an Outback, you know. Uh, <laughs> I do too. That's right. I, I, I mean, that. because it was something new and refreshed. But now that there's so many different styles of restaurant, that that piece of the pie has gotten uh, so many of the pieces have gotten smaller where there's so many different decisions. And then millennials or generation z are deciding well listen i can make that same quality food at home where they're actually focusing more on like blue ribbon or i can go to the grocery store i can pick up something that's already pre-made for me and all i have to do is grab a bottle of wine uh, and i've got more choices and i'm not having to pay a, a bigger expenditure for twice or three times the bottle cost at that particular bottle at a say national account on premise so I think there's a lot of factors what's going to, I think the being a lot more choices. And then there's also being so many different factors where it's either cost of living, there's actually the items that are more expensive out there. So we'll never see again, I, I think where we have the Dardens or the Landry's of the world where there's, you know, with Olive Garden, over 864 locations. You're talking about Carabas, 280 plus restaurants. Where Landry's, you have thousands of restaurants. So, again, we just won't see that again. I think we're, they're going to focus more on regional accounts where it's an, a, maybe an account that is familiar to them and changes their features to more of farm to table, more biodynamic or organic something that are going to be new and fresh and, and kind of exciting instead of the, the same burger time and time after again. So it, again, we've seen a, a change in the atmosphere of restaurants. And I think they're just moving too quickly, trying to make another an appetizer to try to lure someone in where it's either a happy hour feature or a by the glass feature or that lure is is not there anymore where it's they're just looking for something where it's fast and casual and ready to go instead of having to spend two hours at lunch they're more in time to try to go work out get something to eat and then go back to work i think there's so many different facets that are pulling all the again millennials generation z or generation x to go to different uh, restaurants yeah and you're touching on the the fast casual trend that seems to be taking over the more tried and true restaurants that have been out there for the last 20 years and uh, how does wine fit into the this fast casual trend? I mean, are we going to see the usual suspects, the KJs, the Woodbridge, the the Gallows, or these younger customers who kind of have that whole, oh, I want to discover something new. I want to try something new, something that I don't see everywhere. Is that going to change as far as the wine selections go in some of these fast casual places? Absolutely. Um, you mentioned KJ. I mean, it's on every wine list that it's out there with because it, Jed Steele had decided that he wanted to add a little bit of residual sugar to it to make it a little sweeter to, to the American palate, and it just blew up. At this point, we're seeing where they're not wanting those same items that you can see in the grocery store that you'll see in the restaurant because they could compete. And then their consumer is saying, well, listen, I saw KJ for $12.99 at Publix, and then you're going to charge me, you know, $36 to $40 a bottle. Where is, they, they don't see the relevance of having to charge for the lights in the restaurant or the relevance of having a dishwasher actually pay them to wash those glasses and support the staff where they're saying, well, listen, let's get a less expensive item, maybe that says California, but it is a a private label to us where we can put either the restaurant name on it so it looks more boutique more esoteric and I see a lot of our customers either concentrating on a 187 since it's more fast casual they all they have to do if it's a uh, Stelvin enclosure or a screw cap they can twist it give it to them to have a glass and a half they can just take it and walk away at that moment or it's you know being able to pour out of a keg that's being able not 
leaving a carbon footprint with a bottle or a plastic bottle and being able to pour that right out hand it to their customer after they have already made their either tuna poke bowl or if it's uh, chipotle where they've made their burrito bowl i mean it's just it's being able to serve within five minutes i spoke to recently sandy block with legal seafood in the northeast and they're coming up with a concept where they can order fresh ingredient foods bowl either using different proteins or seafoods but that will be made in less than two minutes wow all those ingredients will be ready and ready to rock and roll and be able to serve but it's getting them in and out but also the caveat is they're not proposing any type of beverage program and when i say beverage program not any spirits or any uh, fine wines part of that it's just strictly just making food making it accessible and letting them get on back on the road as quickly as possible hmm so do you think with, with that kind of a concept would like the 187 size wines is that going to fit into that at some point or they're not even looking at that right now you know i think the you know our portfolio having different items in the 187s we have bola which is part of our Italian portfolio. We also have uh, Walnut Crest, we have, or excuse me, Frontera 187s from Chile that gives us another opportunity. But we, again, as I mentioned, keg wines, I think are, are the new opportunity for us that we can you know, sell them a 19.5 liter keg of, of wine and it's going to stay fresh. Don't have to worry about it being in a back room, being cooked or uh, heat or oxygen right. getting to it. But again, um, I see that that pie shrinking. So there's a lot of a lot of wine out there. So I think pricing is going to have a, a lot to be involved with that. But also looking at our port pack Northwest, how are we going to involve the pack Northwest into those criteria in the future? Uh, and it's having those relationships with those buyers because. 80% I, I think with our customers uh, or my customers are, is, is having that relationship and uh, knowing that you're going to be there when they need you and, and they can um, rely on you to be there and, and that it's returning that email and, and making sure that you have those quality products for them in the future. Right. So who are some of your customers that you call on regularly or, or that you put on your list of you know relationships that you're working with now? Well, I, you know, I cover the East Coast, so I, I, it's all the way from Maine all the way down to Florida. And I live in Florida, so a lot of my concentration has to do with Disney, Universal Studios, with Bloomin' Brands, which is going to be Fleming's, Carabas, also Bonefish. Uh, we have Darden, which is involved in there as well, which is Capitol Grill, Bahama Breeze, Seasons 52, Eddie V's. They recently purchased Cheddar's. I call on Melting Pot, Benihana. Also a lot of sporting venues with our um, Airmark or Delaware North uh, with either stadiums or baseball facilities or our amphitheaters. Because in the future, uh, I see that being a, a more of a mix where those are opportunities for us because millennials generation z and generation x have no problem spending money on a concert a football game baseball game hockey so i have focused a lot of my attention more towards sports venues and concert amphitheaters to try to build more relationship with another one was uh, legends as well which they do uh, live nation we also have a relationship with three needy with live nation but also uh, at&t stadium with the dallas with concha toro um, we're the official wine of the jacksonville jaguars in uh, jacksonville florida uh, we also do the predators in nashville so we're seeing more of partnering up with those types of facilities or teams to help promote our wine Wines, not only from Italy, but the Pac Northwest in California and Concha Toro. Wow. That's a pretty broad range of different types of businesses that you call on. And Banfi Vintners, the portfolio is pretty broad and covers wine from all over the world. How do you go about finding the right fits for a particular customer? Like what's, what's the kind of process that you go through, you know, as far as volume, availability, price? I mean, walk us through how you kind of figure that out, how to like, just, I mean, you wouldn't just present everything to everybody. So like, how do you find a focus? 
No, um, we're given a, an RFP, which is it stands for reason for presentation. And my buyers will present that RFP. And this is where their thoughts and their guidelines, where they feel that there's an opportunity. And then there's some uh, discretionary where we can look at their wine list and say where we think opportunities are either with varietals or price points or countries and regions or appellations. It's really those guidelines are set by the buyer, but we also present where, again, where we see opportunities, but we, we first have to listen to our customers. A lot of times I feel a lot of my competitors waste their time by just submitting a presentation where we haven't done our due diligence to really develop the relationship and listen to our customers. That's 80% is, is listening. And the other 20% will just come by doing that due diligence to listen to our customers. And I feel like if we do a better job listing, they'll give us the tools to succeed. Okay. So you're getting a little direction from the actual customer. So that kind of helps it out. Now, how about when you have a, a newer item, like recently Banffy brought in a, a Vermentino, which is really beautiful, but a lot of customers don't even think about Vermentino. Like it's, it's kind of new to the United States, you know, not really well known. How do you go about trying to present something like that? Do you look for like a, a smaller group or a smaller restaurant or is, is it, you kind of like weave it in or how does that work? No, uh, concerning the, the, the Banffy La Bottega La Vermentino with, you know, we're normally two to three years behind Italy or, or I would say Europe for that reason. But this is being such a fresh product. It's sort of like Vignet and, and the cross between Vignet and Savion Blanc. And it's just such a aromatic wine that it's, I think it's broad. It's either a small account. It could be a large account. I think we've come down in the pricing a little bit. It being a six pack helps it out too. It having a vibrant package and also telling the story. La Bottega, meaning the gossiper. There's two ways either you can look at it. Either they call the little old ladies that in Marema that sit on the corner and talk about the other ladies across the street. Those, they call them gossipers, but they also have the birds, the the seagulls or the lark that they have in Marema. They call them Bottegalas as well because they cackle like the old ladies do on the street. <laughs> But I think, I think LTOs is really getting people to a limited time offering is a way to get that product out there. Either start with a 90 day feature uh, in certain locations. We have recently gotten Tommy Bahama in New York to run the Banffy La Bottega Vermentino at, by the glass. And that's the first location. We're looking to add Florida, not only Hawaii, California, Arizona, there's just different opportunities where he presented an RFP where he was looking for an interesting white. So it wasn't Chardonnay. It wasn't Sauvignon Blanc, interesting white. So Vermentino fell perfect and he enjoyed the product. So he's trying it out in New York, but I think that will be one of the ones that will end up on the list because it's just so crisp and goes with seafood crustaceans perfectly. So the LTO is one way, but also wine dinners. I've been presenting that a lot with wine dinners to try to just get that pure trial to get taste out right out of the box, uh, either with uh, the Bottega. We also make a um, very small production Bulgari cab, uh, which is a super Tuscan. It has a little bit of Cavron called Aska from, from Bonfi. So uh, small production, only about 2009 liter cases produced on this particular one, but it, it's exceptional. I mean, when you think about where our neighbors are in the small area of Bulgari is uh, Maseto, uh, Sasakaya, Ornelaya. Those are our neighbors. And we only have 13 acres there. So these small little one-offs that nobody really knows about are easily presented either with an LTO or wine dinners or, or just different thematics or concepts being able to say, okay, great with crab. So this would be, or our shellfish with oysters, looking at our partners over at legal seafood or even 
uh, seasons 52 looking at their seafood that they're doing we're also looking at different concepts with their concha toro group as well swimming with the chileans we're looking at chilean sea bass on how we concept our marquez de casa concha chardonnay and also our Torunio savion blanc that goes perfectly with seafood and how those compare with chilean sea bass so what's even better about chilean sea bass is not a particular time of year that actually is the best time to pull Chilean sea bass you can pull Chilean sea bass from any time of the year so really you can market those wines any time of the year even if it's winter or the fall summer or spring so it's great opportunities with LTOs and wine dinners to present new products yeah and this this fits into what you were alluding to before with a lot of these restaurants that are now changing around their menus uh, you know it, it just makes sense to change around the wine list as well or add you know special things here and there to, just to keep the customer engaged and looking for something new because like you said it, we're way beyond that whole idea of just getting the same thing at the same places all the time yeah without a doubt so when you when you're making some of these presentations and, and especially some of these newer wines that maybe your customer isn't too familiar with how important are things like brand recognition and scores. Of course, there's always the story behind the wine. That's what we always talk about. But how are other factors come in as beyond just price and you know the varietal? What are some of the things that really make a, a wine stand out or, or have a customer's ears perk up? Definitely utilizing our team. We've got the best in the industry at BFE when we talk about being able to drill down data. When we're trying to use either Nielsen data thematics, or we're using uh, technomics where we're using actually wine list data to establish is Pinot Grigio still a hot varietal? How is Prosecco doing? How's it being perceived? How is Rose being perceived in the marketplace? Those numbers are huge when you review somebody's wine list and they don't eat, have a Rose or they don't have a Prosecco on their list. And then we show them that data, how it's increasing. I use Ed Joyce a lot within our company and he's phenomenal in the fact where he can, you know, really drill down the, those important percentages that we need to tell the story, as you alluded to, not only telling the story about the particular wine, but let's tell the story about where it is in the marketplace and how, if they take this particular product, they're going to be able to grow their gross profit and anticipate the needs of either that millennial generation Z or generation X to the next level. And I, I use this a lot. It's more about anticipating the needs of the, our customers, but also our customer's customer and showing that data is really so important. Not only having the story with the wines, the really cool um, varietal or having a great price on it, really hot price. And it's really telling the next level story is, which me means taking dollars to the bank. And that's utilizing that data to the next level. And really that's when you see those buyers, their ears perk up. They're like, they really start nodding their head. They're like, and that, now you're really talking to me when you're talking about taking dollars to the bank and being able to support those. Right. Now, without giving away all of your secrets, what, what are you seeing as wines on the rise or trends that are, what, what do you see happening in the next six to 12 months or even two years from now that people might not be talking about or thinking about right now as far as all the data that you have access to and, and what you're seeing at your level? Well, I definitely see there's an increase not only with telling the stories. I think, you know, as we know that the stories really tell wines, but I think what's enabled us to be on top is our cons constant being perceived as the world's premier wine estate. We, we now recently have been awarded five times with Vin Italy. Um, we continue to rise to the top of being, you know, we're number five producer. And there's a lot of other pedigree wineries within being that top producer. Because when you think about it, you know, the Chateau St. Michel's of the world. Um, when you're also thinking about Behringer, Cake Bread, Camus. And, you know, in 2014, we weren't there, but we continue to grow. We continue to grow with our scores. But when we were talking about different new 
products out there. I definitely feel Italy is still strong. I mean, we're 25% of the market, Australia being 34% of the market. We continue to take those. Uh, Reunited Classics, still number two in volume. Those are just huge numbers. When you think about premiumization, the price segment, we still see an increase of uh, that 20 to or 10 to $20 range is an increase by 7%. If we look at even higher price wines at $20, it's growing at 9%. So people are actually taking more expensive wines to try them out. And I think those are going to be huge for us in the future. Not only those, but I think red blends. If you look at the red blends within the 10 to $20 range, they're growing at 16%. If we look at red blends in the $20 or plus, they're growing at 17%. So those red blends, definitely, if we look at what we're doing from uh, Emiliana with Coyam, the red blend, if we look at Bellagio with Rosso Dolce, also Chintone, red blend for every day. And then uh, a new product from Satori would be La Passione. You know, those are those are some of the modern Italian, which are, are growing. Some of our competitors are having double digit growth, but I think we'll continue on that same path. Yeah. So red blends, Italian red blends, rosé. What have you seen on rosé just in the past year and a half? I mean, it's exploding at retail. Is it the same thing happening on premise? Absolutely. Um, I mean, just the rosé category 750 as a whole is increased by 79%. Wow. I mean, and that's that's crazy. Uh, if you look at as a whole, Banffy rosé growing at almost 136% with Natura, Rainstorm, Unparalleled, or La Floria. All those are at, with triple digit growth. Hmm. What are the different customer segments looking for as far as what from what you can tell as far as millennials, you've got Generation Z, Generation X, all these different segments of the of the market, the boomers. What what are the customers looking for? You know, I, I don't even think they know what they're really looking for to, to, to sound kind of, uh, you know, we normally in the past, you had gone to the varietals that were true to you, which, you know, if you were at a party, you would say, oh, I'll just take some Chardonnay or I'll take Cabernet or, you know, Merlot is still one of the largest producing grape varietals out there, uh, even with the whole sideways effect. But I think, you know, it's just something new or maybe something that's completely different than what they've had before. That's where I, I, I see that opportunities for, I think, perception wise, people think of certain wines. And they go, I'm not going to try that because I, I've never heard of it before. But millennials and Generation Z, they're always trying something new. It's They never stick with the same beer twice. You know, we've seen this explosion of just trial, 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 trial. You'll see it at wine tastings or, or events where people are just tr trying to try as many wines and they're tracking it either on their phone. Um, they're doing it as a QR codes. Uh, they're using, you know, a wine searcher. They're using red laser. There's different items that they're using to track and be able to try different things. So being able to say that if there's something that's new to the future or there's going to be what direction are they going I, I wish i had that crystal ball then i would be able to sell all my restaurants those particular items and and it would be all successful <laughs> yeah and i guess that's where the ltos come into play right to see what is interesting and what sticks and just keep moving things along there is and, and i think um marketing i think has a lot to do with it as well it's making sure that um it's it's a little bit of both retail and on premise. Um, we've got a new brand that's coming out that's called Love Story by Satori, and it's a sparkling. It's a Pinot Grigio. It's a Pinot Noir and a rosé. So, you know, Pinot Noir is still hot. Pinot Grigio is, is still on fire. Uh, Rosés, as you know, and then that sparkling piece with a little bit of residual sugar. I see this going to be you know our break out of the box for Banffy Vintners in the future. It's hitting on all cylinders. Uh, I've got some things in the works with some of our national accounts. I don't want to spill the beans too quickly, but uh, hopefully we'll have a February launch in on-premise with uh, a national chain and really be able to kick it off correctly. Well, that sounds like it's called Love Story. 
February would be the time to kick it off, wouldn't it? Absolutely. We plan on having product by January. That way we can really focus in on Valentine's Day as well. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds exciting. All right. Thomas Harrell, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge about the national accounts on-premise world. Well, thanks for having me. It was uh, always uh, fun and uh, hopefully we can talk really soon again. Yeah, I'd definitely like to do this again sometime. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Wine Biz 360. Do you have a sales story, question, or want to be a guest on the show? Visit winebiz360.com and let us know.